Chapter 17, Red Kayak. Hey there, stranger, Carl called out. I hadn't seen Carl for a while, but he came that morning to pick me up in the ambulance because it was our last day of school. How's it going? He asked as I opened up the passenger door. You been staying out of trouble? I stepped up into the vehicle and slid onto the seat. Yeah, final exams will do that for you. I tried to laugh as I pulled the heavy door shut, but his question wasn't funny. I was in a heap more trouble than I had ever been in my whole life. Carl started off down the driveway. How's the job going for Mrs. D'Angelo? Okay, I'm not working for her this week because of the exams, but I'll, I've been mowing at the grass and stuff. Carl was kind of quiet for a few seconds, and I hoped he didn't think that it was weird, me working for her after what had happened. I'd been worried about how people would see it, I guess, especially kids at school. I looked over at him, but I couldn't see his eyes because of his dark glass glasses. I'm making really good money, I pointed out. Dad even said it was good I had another job this summer because crabs have been few and far between. Carl came back to life. Yeah, yeah, I hear that the season started out pretty slow. As we rode along, I wondered if I should tell Carl about the drill. I even imagined us pulling up behind the dumpster of the 7-Eleven for a few minutes so I could fill him in on what had happened. He'd listen. I knew he would. Then I could ask him what he thought I ought to do. I bit hard on the inside of my cheek. It still scared me to think of anyone else finding out. How do you do on those exams? Carl asked, breaking into my thoughts. All right, I guess. I was pretty sure I'd done okay, although not as well as I could have. I had a hard time concentrating, I said. I don't know why. A lie, because I knew darn well what was on my mind. All week long, every time I saw JT or Digger, we avoided one another until the day Digger caught up with me after school when I was cutting across the field by the tennis courts. I'd been heading for the post office where Mom was picking me up. She did that sometimes to avoid all the traffic in the parking lot when school let out. Brady, hold up, Digger had called. I've been looking for you all day. I had waited for him to catch up. Nervous and fidgety, Digger stood there, rubbing his hands together. Look, I just wondered what you ended up doing, uh, you know, with the drill? Just like Digger, to get right to the point. Nothing, I told him. Nothing? What do you mean, nothing? Just what I said, Digger. I didn't do anything with it. It's at home. He leaned toward me. What? Are you crazy? Hidden. It's hidden, okay? Digger had rolled his eyes dramatically and shook his head. Jeez, you can't take a chance, Brady. You've got to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, I mumbled, turning away. Come on, it's for the best. Digger had called after me. Just do it, Brady. Then everyone will forget what happened. That's what stopped me. The bit about everyone forgetting because I knew no one would. Never in our lifetimes would anyone ever forget what had happened. I swung right around without missing a step and walked straight back to him. Must have looked pretty angry, too, cause, because Digger stepped back and balled up his fist, lifting them above his waist like he was getting ready to take a punch. Let me put it this way, I said point blank. What if it was Hank or Leanne or your, little, or your little sister in that kayak, Digger? Huh? What if Hank or Leanne froze to death in the river that day? You think you could just walk away and say everyone would forget about it? A cruel thing to say because I knew how much Digger loved those kids. He was always looking out for them. Always but I had to make him see. Digger was speechless. Slowly, he brought his hands down. Turning, I stomped away again, all the way across the field to the post office, but opening the door to Mom's car, I glanced over the roof and saw that Digger was still standing there in the field. I stared out the window of the ambulance, looking back on this just as we came up on Digger's house. Carl slowed down because there was a police car in the yard. Thoughts scrambled in my head. Did the truth get out? I sat up and a muscle tightened in my chest. Big fight there early this morning, Carl said, stopping. Here? At Digger's? Yeah. My eyes widened. I wondered if Digger's father had let him have it, if he found out the trouble Digger was in and he flew off the ham handle. Same old thing, Carl said. The old man beating up on his wife. Carl knew all this stuff because he listened to the, listens to the police radio, plus a lot of those police and firemen hung out together. I hear she took the kids over to her sister's in Denton, he said. Digger's mom always does that, I told him. Every time they have a fight, she takes the kids and leaves. Then, two days later, she comes back. We stared at the mess in Digger's front yard. 
tires, rusted wheel rims, an old automobile frame up on cinder blocks, and a large wooden spool from some wire Digger's father had hauled once. I turned to Carl, hesitating a little before I asked, Do you know what the fight was about? Carl shook his head. Nah, probably wasn't nothing to fight about. It's just him, old man Griswold, drinking and being ornery. He shook his head. Digger's mother ought to have that guy arrested. I sighed with relief, then looked back at Digger's house. Even if I was mad at Digger for what he had done, I couldn't help but feel a little bit sorry for my old friend. Digger's mom's too afraid to do anything, I said. I remember once Digger told me how his parents had such a big fight in the middle of the night that he took his little brother and sister and walked over to his grandfather's house. I always thought that was so sad. Digger and those little kids padding down the road in the dead of night in their slippers and to get away from their own parents. A real shame, Carl said. He shifted out of park and drove on. I'm sure Digger won't be in school today. No, I guess he won't. I agreed, realizing at the same time that Digger would miss the ceremony this afternoon, the one where we graduate from middle school. At 2 p.m., the entire school shuffled into the auditorium where each of us eighth graders was awarded a certificate and a discount coupon to King's Dominion, an amusement park in down in Virginia. A few kids got some awards, most musical, most athletic, that kind of thing. I stood twice for recognition, once with the kids who were on the honor roll all three years, and second because I played on the Seahawks tournament winning basketball team. Half a dozen parents came to watch, but most of our parents had to work, including my own. After the sixth and seventh graders went back to class, we stayed for refreshments. A couple mothers had a table spread out with plates and napkins and a big white bakery cake that said congratulations written on it. It looked pretty nice, but that type of cake is way too sweet for me. I didn't even take a piece, just picked it up a paper cup full of lukewarm green punch and sipped at it. Afterward, I was kneeling down to clean out my locker and I was surprised to hear JT's voice. Brady, he said. Despite everything, I was glad to see him. Hey, I said, standing up. How's it going? JT asked. Okay, I replied, scratching the back of my neck, wondering if he was about to ask about the drill, too. How about you? JT shrugged. My dad's still sick. That's too bad, I sympathized. So I've been working a lot. A log moment followed where neither of us said anything. I reached into my locker and peeled off the class schedule taped inside the door. I just wanted to thank you, JT said. I frowned. For what? You know, he glanced around suspiciously, then lowered his voice to his whisper. For not saying anything. What were we now? A bunch of criminals? I crumbled the schedule in my hand. JT seemed anxious. He kept licking his lips. So maybe you want to come over tomorrow? I can't. I'm going up to Rhode Island to see my cousins. And as I said that, I wondered if he'd think I was lying because of how he made up a story about seeing his cousins right after Ben died. JT hung his head. Brady, I just wondered if we could, you know, like, be friends again. We allowed our eyes to meet. Of course I wanted to be friends. More than anything else in the world, I wanted us to be friends. I didn't want anything to change because in my life or his. But it didn't mean I wasn't angry at him for what he did with Digger. JT shrugged. I just wanted to be friends. That's all. Yeah, sure, I replied softly. Is, it, is that a yes or a definite maybe? JT asked, his voice lifting a little. A definite maybe it was an oxymoron. The slightest glimmer in his eyes caught mine before he raised his hand. Have a good time in Rhode Island. Call me when you get back, he said, curling his fingers in his hand and cuffing me lightly on the shoulder.